Hello, so I'm just going to give a quick update because I've started two new books and I'm not deep into either of them so I don't have a lot to say, but I started Summer Night which is the fourth book in the Dresden Files and this one is about Faye. <laughs> so it starts off really interestingly. Um, it has a, a new, um, mm, mm, okay, wow. We're in book four. I can't tell you anything about what happened in this intro scene. We have a new person enter Harry's life that says, hey, you know that obstacle? You know that deal that you made? That thing that you're beholden to? Well, everything's changed. <laughs> so that's kind of the intro scene. It was a really strong intro. I think that Dresden books just generally, their opening scenes, their cold openings are always really strong for intrigue and for all of that. So what I'm really enjoying about these books, oh, by the way, I have a cold or allergies, something's happening. Uh, so sorry for my voice. What I'm really enjoying about these books is as how much things are carrying over into the next. It's not just like, here's your next detective story. These are unrelated. Read them in whatever order you want. It is very much Dresden is learning and growing and things that happened that bad things that happened in previous books do get carried over and the plot line just continues and while there may be a gap of time between uh, books it it doesn't matter because the timeline is still there and the consequences of the last book are still there if a character has been harmed or affected by what happened in the vampire book that character is still affected and that's still affecting Harry Dresden so I really like that element of it and that makes it feel more like it makes me it certainly helps me to want to keep going now this one is all about Faye and I feel like with every single Dresden book so far I have said I don't really care about werewolves but let's see what Butcher does with it I don't really care about vampires but let's see what Butcher does with it here we are with Faye and do you know I don't really care about Faye I mean granted I'm not when I, I am not the type of fantasy reader that typically deals with a lot of fantasy creatures I'm usually hanging out with humans with magic or dragons I don't hang out or mermaids I don't hang out with a lot of mythological creatures so this is really on me but I also feel like Butcher is trying to tackle every single one of my least the ones that I'm the least interested in first <laughs> but anyway they're fey they're sexy hot fey <laughs> So that's what this book is so far. Um, I mean, it's a lot more than that, obviously, but it's also kind of hard to talk about four books in, but I am enjoying it so far. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing where we go with this. Oh, right. We did also get early on in the book. We got a big twist, something in Harry's life that Harry thought was, or rather, mm, yeah, I'll say it like that, something in Harry's life that Harry thought was out of his life that is suddenly relevant once again. Was it something? that I totally predicted from the first book. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, whatever. It'll be interesting to read about. And then I've also started Blood Over Brighthaven. I've only read two chapters, so I'm not gonna tell you anything about it in this particular clip other than by chapter two, I was already very hooked and very invested for very specific reasons so we'll unpack that more when I get a little bit deeper in so that I can give you a proper okay here's what this book is doing here's what it's about uh, but I just wanted to really quick check in just in case I'm going to lose my voice in the next day or two I want to really quick get you a clip to say hey here's what I'm reading and then hopefully I'll be able to come back and finish this vlog welcome to the vlog So I did in fact lose my voice uh, for a couple of days, which is why I had to miss yet another reading vlog. I'm sorry, but I did finish Summer Night. So the 
summer and winter courts of these fairies of these fae were very intricate and detailed the different workings of these courts the way uh the different hierarchies and uh positionings and titles that they held it was a lot to keep track of but it also opened up the world so much and i already love butcher's world building so having the world expanded to this degree was really fun to read I also think that some of the established relationships in this book uh, were developed really well. For instance, there's Harry and Murphy. Um, Murphy was a lot less present in the last book, and I missed her, even though their dynamic has been a little bit repetitive up to this point, but we're really seeing not completely repetitive. There's definitely been progress and there's been you know consequences to certain actions and the relationship has been tested a lot their friendship has been tested a lot but also their dynamics as far as like misunderstanding each other or combating each other and all that their their dynamic is developing a lot in a far less frustrating way which i really like because i like murphy a lot naturally. So I want to see them be able to overcome these hurdles that they've had and be able to become good partners, good, you know, teammates. Again, a character in this book became prevalent that uh, was heavily foreshadowed, but, um, you know, whatever. It, it added a lot to this book, I think, and the dynamic between Harry and this character, I think, was fascinating <laughs> to try to figure out. And naturally learning a lot more about the White Council also just broadened things a lot more. It was fascinating to read about. And Harry himself, too, was great in this book. We still have his sarcastic nature we still have him just being such a normal guy in a supernatural world like he's experiencing these crazy supernatural things like going going into another realm walking on what is essentially stardust and having these incredible experiences and in his mind he's just like mm, couldn't have made an escalator like he's just he's so Harry. <laughs> but, and, and with that, with his very sarcastic and uh, aloof nature, there was one line that was really funny where he insulted this eternal being that was all powerful. And she was like, I will not forget this offense. And he was like, I probably will. Happens to me all the time. Or, or this is just a normal day for me or something like that. Like his, his very off the cuff disrespect <laughs> is very charming. Um, and also I feel like I'm really getting to know his character so much much more. He's such a selfless character and he he gives so much of himself to try to help the people that he cares about to the point and 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 a lot of that ends it puts him in hot water where he ends up in these situations where it's like, okay, should I choose to go this route or that route? Which one is going to cost me less? Because they're both going to cost me a lot. Like he kind of can't catch a break, but he also in the midst of that can't catch a break. Uh, nature of the series he's also constantly trying to figure out okay but what can I do to help the people I love and I really love that noble nature of him and I also just kind of want to pat him on the head and be like just go easy on yourself pal because he's he's just he's got so much self-loathing and I I, I just I want I want him to take a breath maybe take a nap that might be a shower would be good in this particular book and just breathe and and it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay pal all that said there was also all the th all the complaints all the problems that i've had with the first three books they were still present in this book like yeah it was a more it was a much better stru structured book than the other books and it op it opened up the world so much more but i mean like the stuff that i complained about in my dresden video is still here so i don't know if at any point this stuff lessens but it continues to be annoying to me anyway that was a whole lot of praise for this book. What's funny is most people say book four is when it all takes off. Book four is like, book, it puts books one through three to shame. Funny thing is, I said a whole bunch of positive about it, a little bit of negative, and uh, it's not my favorite Dresden book, nor is it my second favorite so far. It's still Grave Peril at the top. I mean, the fact that Michael wasn't in this book is a sin in and of itself. Uh, Grave Peril at the top, then uh, Stormfront is still my number two 
And then uh, Summer Night would be my third favorite so far, and Full Moon is still at the bottom. You heard me say a lot of things, so don't get mad at me now that I've ranked them, because I obviously liked this book. I just happen to still really like books three and one. I also have made a lot of progress in Blood Over Brighthaven. Uh, I am almost 40% through the ebook. I'm, I just finished chapter eight. So this book is a lot to try to explain in a concise manner, so I probably just won't. So we follow a girl, oh, what's her, how do I say her name? You know how you read something in your head and you never actually have to pronounce the name and then it comes time to say it out loud and you're like, oh wait, I gotta, I gotta double check that because I don't know. Siona maybe would be how you would pronounce her name. I'm not sure, but Siona is an incredibly ambitious girl. She doesn't really have family. Uh, she doesn't, she doesn't have a lot, but what she does have is her intellect and her ambition. So she's a very smart girl and uh, in this society, there are the high mages and it's all, it's all men. And um, once every 10 years, a woman is allowed to test to try to become a high mage. And she gets to be that woman this year. And it's super exciting for everybody but her. Her, she feels extraordinary pressure. And at the beginning of the book, one of her friends told her, it's okay, um, this is actually really easy for you because if you fail, so what? Every woman fails, so like no pressure. And she's like, all the pressure because they only allow once every 10 years a woman to test so if i fail that means i'm i'm proof of this concept that they have i'm i'm proof that yeah women shouldn't be testing and also that means that for 10 more years another woman can't test i have all the pressure in the world on me so that's kind of like the opening situation that she's in and i mean it's on the back description she gets through she's in she's she's a high mage now i mean i think the testing is chapter two no the testing starts in chapter one and by chapter two she's already a high mage so that doesn't feel like a spoiler to me that's the premise of the book but naturally once she gets into this high mage school where she thinks okay now it's all about intellect it's all about us striving to learn this and to uh, be able to complete the tests and complete what we need to do once she gets into this she thinks that it's all going to be fun and games, but obviously it's not. She has one colleague in particular who uh, is uh, punchable. He's punchable. Who's like, you know, you slept your way into this and you all this sort of stuff. So she still has to push back against a lot of stuff. But fun enough, Siona happens to be the most insufferable person in the world because while she faces all of this pushback and all of this oppression and all of these things, she also happens to be a complete and total hypocrite. So in this world, there are these people called the Kwan. The Kwan are essentially enslaved. They have to work for their entire lives in servitude. They're a lower class citizen and their pay is pennies and uh, and they basically just have to be very submissive and like, yes ma'am, yes sir, like kind of dialogue. And there's also a lot of ideals about them being unclean and uneducated. So Siona has all these prejudices herself. So she goes on these monologues about like people treating her based off of her gender. And then she turns around and she's like, that dirty Quan or like, oh wow, it's amazing that he can actually understand what I'm saying because his people are so unintelligent. So she's real rough to be in the head of. And naturally one of her colleagues who is in charge of employing the people on this particular floor uh, as a slide to her, he's, he doesn't give her a lab assistant and instead he's like, that Kwan can be your lab assistant instead. So she develops a friendship with Tamil and uh, they, work together she teaches him all about the magic and we learn through her dialogue about the magic so it is a little bit like you could you could accuse this book of being info dumpy because it is chapters of just let me explain the magic to you because it's a very intricate magic system there's layers to the spells there's the main spells and then there's sub spells it's very math focused it's very intellect focused so like to move a small object would be a different equation than to move a large object because you have to take weight into account and uh, really complicated spells are a whole web of things and so it's very very intricate and if you're interested in complex magic systems wow you're gonna like this because it's very alchemy it's very it's very scientific um, and it's very detailed I think it's super interesting but if you're not into that then those chapters would be pretty boring but anyway she's she has to teach him this magic so that he can assist her and of course his cultural knowledge 
knowledge and historical background of his people ends up lending a lot to her scientific research as well as forcing her to confront how much information has been manipulated and controlled for a certain purpose. But even as she's getting this information and even as she's being confronted with these things, she still is... It, Tamil will say like, oh, well, you know, if if my people don't work, if we can't work, then, you know, we're killed. Or if we die in an accident because magic was used, cut, corners were cut because this is like, there's no margin for error with this magic. So it's like if if something happens and one of us die, it's not reported on because what what's our life matter? And she just laughs at him and she's like, your people are so melodramatic. Like, I'm telling you, she's punchable too. Anyway, wow, I've been talking about this for a long time. There's just so much to unpack about this story. And even though I'm talking about it aggressively on my Discord, like every chapter, I'm like, ah, let's yell some more. I still don't, I still want to talk about it some more. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot. This book is a lot, but it's also fascinating. It's so well written. The, the it's, it's so interesting. Like there's so much that I'm loving about this. It's just also everybody should be punched, but Tom Hill, Tom Hill's awesome, but everybody else should be punched. Anyway, this was a, this was a very long check-in. I'm sorry about that. Bye. Blood Over Bright Haven. So I think I said this in the last clip, but this is by M.L. Wang. This is the same author that wrote Sword of Kaigen, which I loved. Um, I can see this being a, a more divisive book than Kaigen was. So I'm gonna try to articulate why so that you can maybe decide if you want to pick it up or not. This is a book that follows Siona and Tamil very closely, and it mostly takes place in the room where they're studying. Occasionally we change locations, but it's not very environmental. There's not a lot to describe. We very rarely even step outside the walls of where they're studying together, so we don't even really take a closer look at the world that they're living in outside of just discussing it. This is a book that has a discussion that it's wanting to have. Part of it is in Siona, in what we discussed previously for her character. She is intentionally a very aggravating character to be in the head of sometimes because of her blatant non not understanding of her own hypocrisy. <laughs> and some of her internal monologue is supposed to be agitating. And at least to me, it comes off like the point is because ML Wang has some stuff that she wants to discuss within this narrative, and I think she does so very well. There's a lot of thought-provoking scenes in this book, and there's a lot of stuff that begs to be pulled out and discussed more thoroughly. But where Sword of Kaigen is criticized for being a slow build, I think that the blood of a bright haven certainly is as well now don't get me wrong there are some really visceral scenes in this book there are scenes where people are literally being unraveled literally being torn apart like peeled there's some really strong scenes so don't get me wrong when i say that this is a very this is a very close book that kind of occupies a small space because there's a lot being unraveled in this world. There's a lot of ideals being confronted and there's some very vivid imagery happening. But where sort of Kaigen is, uh, is uh, talked about as a slow build with a huge payoff in the second half, I would say the same is true for Blood Over Bright Haven. It is a very slow build, but it has such a good payoff. And I personally really really enjoyed this book. As I said, Siona can be a very frustrating character to follow and to be in the head of, but she does have a lot of learning that she does, a lot of her own ideals that she has to confront, that she has to look at in the face and figure out what she's going to do with them. She's also a very selfish character, really focused on putting her name on history to see that her legacy is known and that she makes a difference and people remember her. And that through a lot of 
discussion and confrontation, she realizes that there's a lot more to life than just your name and there's a lot more to life than what you're trying to do, what your intent is, but the effect you have on the world, the effect your actions have on the world matters and matters greatly. And she has to make a lot of decisions based on that. It was a satisfying end. I. I really enjoyed this book. I also finally read I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, which I planned on reading last month, decided to put off uh, until this month, and I have finally read it. So spoiler-free thoughts on it. In this introduction, we learn that these two characters, who are our main characters, Sakura, and then we don't actually learn his name until later on in the book. These two characters uh, are the characters that we follow, but we know from the first chapter that Sakura is going to die. It starts off by letting us know that she's passed away and that he missed her funeral and he's talking about his last words to her. And then we back it up and we start the story. So we know what this is about from the beginning. We know what we're getting into from the start and we see their introduction to their friendship or forced friendship. We see them bond. We see them get to know each other better. We see them start to influence one another's lives and be affected by each other's lives and really change their own perspectives on how they want to live based off of these interactions that they have with each other. And then we get to, you know, the rest of the story. So that's the plot. But I want to take a second to talk about how incredible the structuring of this is because it tells us from the jump what's going to happen. And yet the way it does it, it gives us information on what to look for. And then enough time passes that it kind of fades. At least this was my experience. It faded to the back of my mind. So I wasn't really thinking about it until that moment comes and the thing, the, the cue that was given to us from the beginning happens. And when that happens, I went from cozy, sweet, joyful, great stuff to, oh no, it's time. And it crashes, the realization crashes in. So it's still so effectual. But it's not only that, I love that the structure of the story enforces what the story does. So a big part of this is in how these two characters learn from each other and how they choose to live. Sakura knows that she has about a year left to live. She has this terminal illness and she's writing a book about it says living with dying and it's her journal it's her story and day by day she's choosing to live out these days and live them to the fullest and her choice in the way that she's living is to remember that just because her end is inevitable she's still going to have an effectual life and the narrative of this story is exactly that even though we know the inevitability of what's to come in this story because it says so in chapter one it doesn't change the effect of the story when that inevitability hits. This is a very well-told bittersweet story where it it had the conclusion, it had the closure within it. So you walk away, or I walked away, feeling like satisfied despite what the story was. And it's all told in this one bind up. So super quick read. That's everything that I read this week, or rather, I'm sorry, over the last two weeks, because I had to skip last week's vlog because of the cold. So over the last two weeks, I listened to the audiobook for Summer Night, the next Dresden book. I read Blood Over Bright Haven, and I read I Want to Eat Your Pancreas. I also have been reading Dragon Ball Z, but this vlog is long enough, so we'll talk about that next week. I hope you had a good reading week. Bye!